Welcome to Man in America. I'm your host, Seth Holhouse. So there's something insidious flowing through the heart of almost every economy and financial system in the world. It's used by some of the most powerful people to take over entire countries. What I'm talking about is inflation. It acts like a hidden tax on wealth. So how is it a hidden tax? Well, to truly understand the answer to this question, we need to understand our relationship to money as citizens and how the government and banks play a role in influencing the economy. We also need to understand what truly makes a currency or money system a tool for prosperity as opposed to a weapon for corruption and tyranny. Folks, I'll tell you ahead of time, this is an informationally dense episode. The monetary system has been used as a weapon against us, and if we want to know how to protect ourselves and even fight back, we have to understand how it works. Now, let's get into this. Let's take a look at a quote from the University of Minnesota's Principles of Economics series that provides a refreshingly clear explanation of what's going on, unlike most official sources. Money, ultimately, is defined by people and what they do. This single quote says a lot and we'll unpack it as we go. As it turns out, people and their choices, our choices such as what we want, how much we're willing to pay, and if we can be trusted both as individuals and as a society, all play a massive role in the economy, our economy. So if we overcharge or undercharge for things in our civilization, it comes at the cost of someone else's economic prosperity. This leads to a toxic game of financial musical chairs. The people who now have less use that as an excuse to justify criminal behavior that destabilizes society, which causes a loss of confidence and that ultimately triggers inflation. Confidence here means trust. Trust that the things you need as a business owner and as a citizen in general are stable enough so you can plan a decent life. Waking up one day to realize that gas, for instance, has doubled in price can have a destabilizing impact. How this is a game of musical chairs we'll explain in more detail later. So for now, think of it like this. If you're a mom and pop baker and you need to charge two bucks a bagel to pay your business costs, but you have to compete with a huge chain in your town that only charges $1.90 per bagel, you'll have to recoup your business costs somewhere else, like for more for cream cheese. This passes the cost onto your customers, while at the same time making you less competitive. Your customers, having to pay a bit more, will themselves need to alter their behavior, creating a daisy chain butterfly effect situation that ripples throughout the entire economy. And what's more, greedy and immoral bankers can use our ignorance of money against us. We can be deceived into thinking a financial system is good when in fact it's actually a parasitic draw on society. Yes, it's that bad, and I'll explain why. Here are two quotes from the people who likely knew the danger of allowing deceptive and immoral bankers to control the nation's money. The first quote comes from the 20th president of the United States, James A. Garfield, who said, whoever controls the volume of money in any country is absolute master of all industry and commerce. The second quote comes from none other than Henry Ford, the founder of Ford Motor Company. It is well enough that people of the nation do not understand our banking and monetary system. For if they did, I believe there would be a revolution before tomorrow morning. Wow. So let's continue with the principle of economic series, which says we, the people, influence money profoundly. Look at this quote. When people use something as a medium of exchange, it becomes money. If people were to begin accepting basketballs as payments for goods, and most services, basketballs would be money. Think about that. What we decide to use as money and how well we use it as individuals, as a nation, is the single largest and most influential factor for the health of any economy and the stability of the chosen currency. Each person, each one of us acts as a monetary authority. We help determine the value of something by what we agree to spend money on and for how much. For example, if everyone refuses to pay the current price of gas, gas companies will be forced to reduce the price. Conversely, if everyone today agrees to pay double what the price of gas was yesterday, this becomes the new normal price. 
In traditional economics, the so-called market is what determines price based upon supply and demand. If demand is high, then a seller might charge more because they know people will pay. If supply is high, the seller might charge less to make their product more enticing in comparison to their competitors. When prices rise across multiple markets, we call that inflation. When prices fall, we call it deflation. For instance, if gas went up a dollar in addition to milk and bread and so on, these price increases would be described as inflation. More precisely, inflation refers to the loss of purchasing power, which is also known as the devaluation of the currency. And remember, don't let any money jargon intimidate you. You can just think about it this way. If you filled your gas tank today for $20 and tomorrow the same amount of gas was $40, that means the value of the dollar in relation to the gas went down by 50%. It's worth half of what it was the previous day. And as we explore, you'll see there's a few reasons why our money gets devalued. So in today's world, we don't really set prices as individuals. In the past, we haggled in the marketplace. We'd argue with the seller about what the price should be. Once the purchase is complete, the next person who watched your haggle makes their offered price based on what they saw you pay. In modern societies, prices are set by businesses that don't want you to negotiate. The seller sets the price, like Walmart or ExxonMobil, and if a customer doesn't want to pay it, they go home empty-handed. Right here, we can see that money is defined by our actions, by what people do. Money's value is defined by what we agree to pay or not. This is buyer-influenced price setting. On the other side of the negotiating table, sellers define money's value by what they charge for their goods and services. Generally speaking, sellers want more profit and therefore they tend to want prices to go up or costs to drop. On the other hand, buyers want prices to go down. This is the supply and demand and free market influence of price changes. So what's the relationship between prices and inflation? Well, think of it like this. It's like the difference between waves and tides in the ocean. So prices are like individual waves on a beach. They go up and down individually. While the rising tide on a beach is like inflation, all the waves move up together as the entire water level rises. Remember, when a lot of goods and service prices rise together, we call this inflation. The value of money is going down. So there's another aspect of money that is extremely important. So money is a unit of account. It helps us quickly and easily determine something's value, assuming, of course, that we have confidence in prices being fair. In markets that don't allow haggling or point-of-sale negotiation between buyer and seller, you no longer need to spend hours at the market arguing with sellers to get a fair price. Haggle properly, this isn't worth 19. You just said it was worth 20. Oh dear, oh dear. Come on, haggle. All right, I'll give you 10. That's more like it. 10? Are you trying to insult me? Me with a poor dying grandmother? 10? All right, I'll give you 11. Now you're getting it. 11? <laughs> but is this what we have today? Where sellers always set a fair price and you're confident you're not being overcharged? Well, not quite. Instead, we have a system where prices are often set by massive businesses that collude with each other to force consumers to pay whatever they decide is fair. During an interview with NPR titled, Why Corporations Are Reaping Record Profits with Inflation on the Rise, Dion Robun, the reporter at the Wall Street Journal who has interviewed sitting presidents and dozens of central bank governors and finance ministers, described the situation like this. Companies aren't being forced to raise prices because of inflation. They're raising prices because they can. His answer was in response to a discussion about inflation and the effects of the COVID pandemic. You know prices have gone up. One reason this happens is because it costs more to produce a product, so a big company passes that rising cost on the consumer. But the other reason prices have gone up is that the value of the dollar has gone down, which means you need more dollars to get the same amount of stuff. So the reporter adds that inflation sort of disguises these price increases. When prices for everything around you are rising, it's much easier for companies to raise their prices and not experience consumer blowback. What he's saying here is that companies can often blame rising prices on inflation when in fact, they're driving up their prices using inflation as an excuse. 
And because we hear the news talk about inflation and we're conditioned to expect prices to rise, we don't boycott a business or find a competitor. What I find interesting though, is that this creates a positive feedback loop. A positive feedback loop is a technical way of saying, when businesses believe inflation is on the rise and costs are getting higher, they raise their prices in advance, which in turn causes prices to rise, which then causes the inflation they were trying to get ahead of in the first place. But this is a fairly modern development and usually only businesses that are big enough to hire financial forecasters know about the coming inflation problem. Smaller businesses won't raise prices for the most part until they really have to. So how can we know if prices are rising from inflation or because of coordinated price gouging between businesses, also called collusion? By the way, business collusion to raise prices is an antitrust violation. Well, what's antitrust? Well, it means that prices might not be as fair as we'd like to think. Now, hold on. Let me pause and make it clear that I'm not a socialist. You probably know that by now. I don't believe that if someone is rich from running a successful business that they're evil or bad. But we have to recognize that some people and corporations have no problem taking advantages of situations to make unfair profits. A massive business can raise prices and even if customers stop buying for a while, they can weather that much easier than a small mom and pop shop. Several hundred years ago, there were almost no big businesses like we have today mostly just mom and pop outfits that would go out of business if they try to raise prices unfairly. But now almost everything we buy comes from mega corporations that can essentially price gouge and just for the public who will eventually submit to their highest prices. And when businesses conspire behind the scenes unlawfully, they're corrupt. Now profiteering is a word that means the act or activity of making an unreasonable profit on the sale of essential goods, especially during times of emergency. So one of the reasons inflation from profiteering happens is because there's a lack of transparency. It's not entirely clear why a company decides to raise their prices. It's often blamed on rising costs or inflation, but it could just be easily blamed on a simple greed, at least at one level. So you and I know that money really isn't the ultimate goal of this story. Klaus Schwab's Great Reset and Agenda 2030 are the real goal with massive corporate collusion. At least this is the conclusion I've drawn in my own research. So in a free market economy with lots of healthy competition, if a company like Apple decides to raise prices of cell phones by say 200%, most customers will refuse to pay as long as a competitor like Samsung can provide a similar product at a reasonable price. But what if all the cell phone companies meet secretly and agree to raise their prices together? You see, this is called collusion or antitrust. It's also called a monopoly where there's only one company to choose from and no competitors exist. So at the turn of the century, Standard Oil, a Rockefeller company, was broken up for being a monopoly and essentially gouging customers. It's a serious problem because if the price of oil needlessly goes up, and we use oil to do a lot of things, that means the prices of all of those things oil is used for goes up, inflation. So this problem was partially solved, at least for a while, by antitrust laws that were enacted in the late 19th century. It was also an antitrust lawsuit that got Bill Gates in trouble in the 90s. Well, thankfully because of antitrust laws, we never have to worry about companies colluding with each other to overcharge customers and drive up inflation, right? Well, that's not the case. Robert Reich, who used to serve as the US Secretary of Labor, had this to say about it. Antitrust used to be a real thing, but since the early 80s, antitrust has taken a back seat. In fact, some would say it's been thrown out of the car altogether. And big companies now routinely have the power to raise prices. Customers will note that there is almost an exact price matching among all major so-called competitors because they're not really competing. Whether it's from price gouging due to greedy producers, price collusion, or devaluation of currency by the banks or government, inflation is a serious problem. You start to see that now? Well, as the old saying goes, crap rolls down the hill, and inflation hits the poor harder than it does the rich. It's essentially a game of economic musical chairs. 
So when inflation hits, when prices rise, someone with lots of extra money feels it, but they can easily weather the storm because of their wealth reserves. However, when you're living paycheck to paycheck and gas almost doubles in price, as it has for a lot of people since beginning of 2022, you may not have enough to make ends meet. Eventually you can't pay your bills and you go bankrupt. You lose a seat when the music stops. And this might be one of the most insidious acts of inflation. As a matter of fact, lots of people think that inflation is essentially used as a tool to rob the population of their property. How? Because when you go bankrupt, you often sell your belongings at pennies on the dollar. A wise investor or a person holding your debt, like a banker, can swoop in and gobble up all your stuff on the cheap. Thomas Jefferson is credited for saying, quote, if the American people ever allow private banks to control the issue of their currency, first by inflation, then by deflation, the banks and corporations that will grow up around them will deprive the people of all property until their children wake up homeless on the continent their fathers conquered. I believe that banking institutions are more dangerous to our liberties than standing armies. The issuing power should be taken from the banks and restored to the people to whom it properly belongs. Maybe it sounds a bit conspiratorial, but when you look at the facts, he isn't wrong. When hyperinflation hits, like it has many times throughout history, like after World War I in the Weimar Republic, people often lose everything to those who have the money and power to buy it back for rock bottom prices. I'm gonna come back to this, but first I want you to think about another property of money that helps us in a modern civilization. Money is measuring power. So the unit of account property of money is one of the least understood, which if people lose confidence in, inflation occurs. So a unit of account simply means a standard measure. An inch should be an inch everywhere. It shouldn't change every time it's used. We can use money to measure something's value, and the more consistent the measurement, the more prosperity and wealth can be created in that nation. If I asked you how much a cup of coffee cost, you can go to any coffee shop and look at the price. The price is the measurement of its value, at least at the retail level. If I asked you how tall someone is, you could hold a measuring tape up and look at the top of their head to say, well, they're five feet tall. Similarly, money serves as the yardstick for monetary value. Looking again to the University of Minnesota's Principle of Economics series, it has this to say about money's property as a unit of account. Ask someone in the United States what he or she paid for something, and that person will respond by quoting a price in dollars. I paid 75 bucks for this radio, or I paid 15 bucks for the pizza. People do not say, I paid five pizzas for this radio. That statement might, of course, be literally true in the sense of the opportunity cost of the transaction, but we do not report prices that way for two reasons. One is that people do not arrive at places like Radio Shack with five pizzas and expect to purchase a radio. The other is that the information will not be very useful. Other people may not think of values in pizza terms, so they may not know what that meant. Instead, we report the value of things in terms of money. So just like a ruler measures length and a watch measures time, we need money to measure value to help us exchange or trade goods and services. How can a team of contractors work together to build a house if they can't agree on the length of a foot? How can a restaurant serve their customers if their workers all have different definitions of when work starts? When you can trust in a system of measurement, it's called confidence in the system. And with confidence, you have a solid foundation. People in an economy have the stable ground they need to do work, manufacture goods, and most importantly, sell them for a fair price to the people that need and want them. The idea of confidence in the measuring power of money strikes at the heart of why there is so much corruption and ultimately how to solve it. Why? Because when standards of measurement break down, people can't get on the same page, which means they can't work together efficiently. We call this a lack of confidence or trust. This doubt or suspicion leads to people overcharging just in case they experience a loss in the future which triggers a chain reaction that can have a major impact on the economic prosperity of a nation. Martin Armstrong, a self-made millionaire, financial forecaster, and villain in the eyes of mainstream economists, believes that the primary cause of inflation is lack of confidence in the government or the future. Let me explain. 
So if you believe the government was going to collapse, would you be confident to open a new bakery business? Probably not. No one would be able to buy bread if there is no electricity or law and order. Think about what happened to some of the business owners who had stores near the summer riots of 2020. When civil unrest hits, people stop working, they stop spending money, which causes a shortage of goods and services, leading to a rise in prices. So this means that whatever bread is left would skyrocket in price because one, the baker needs to charge more to recoup the costs in a collapsing economy. And two, because people would bid up the price to win the chance at a loaf of bread. When supply declines, the trust in the government goes down. People resort to haggling again, and the price naturally rises due to greed and uncertainty in the future. All this drives up inflation far more than any other factor. This is what led to the hyperinflation in the Weimar Republic of Germany, where after World War I, their currency's value dropped multiple times in less than a few years. Imagine the price of milk going up 10 times within a week, or even overnight. So that's hyperinflation, which causes another aspect of inflation to come to the forefront. The loss of confidence in a nation's currency is also a measure of value. And keep in mind, when measurements break down, cooperation becomes risky and almost impossible. Listen to this quote, which is said to be from one of the most influential financiers and bankers of the past 500 years. Mayor Amschel Rothschild, founder of the Rothschild banking dynasty. Give me control of a nation's money supply, and I care not who makes its laws. Now, to be clear, some historians disagree whether he said this or not. But regardless, the statement's actually pretty true. But why would controlling a nation's money supply be so important? More important than controlling the laws of the land, or guns, or political power? You see, the way central bankers control the money supply often helps them and other corrupt forces make money off the backs of hard-working, trusting people like you and me. The money supply is the total amount of money within an economy which can be used to control all sorts of things by manipulative bankers like the price of goods and services, how much money is available for paying debt, and even controlling whether people feel the need to work or feel they have enough savings to take a vacation. A good analogy is a game of musical chairs. If there's enough money supply, there's enough chairs. If there's not enough, people scramble to get whichever chairs are left. Now, there's more to it than a simple comparison, but that's a good place to start. Inflation is actually just one part of a much bigger discussion about law, rights, money, citizenship, and how we as people live together in a society or civilization. A lot of the problems we deal with as people in the modern age can be chalked up to forgetting essential principles. To understand why inflation can be such a problem and why advanced societies need to solve it, we have to look at why money is a medium of exchange in the first place and how it acts as a standard measure of value. Standardized measures of value or fair units of account are both fancy ways of saying that the money system has to recognize an important principle, that it takes time, energy, and resources to produce goods and services. Nothing is ever truly free. Now, that doesn't mean we need to start charging money for literally everything that we do, but we can't forget that even if someone gave us a box of freshly baked cookies, they still had to buy the ingredients, spend time cooking, and use energy to do so. A fair price ensures that those costs can be paid back so that more goods and services can be produced. If someone overcharges or undercharges, then the whole delicate economy can quickly spiral out of control. Just like if everyone decided to use different ways of measuring time, coordinating work would be really, really difficult. So I hope you're starting to see now that the most powerful influence on a money system is actually the people using it. It's you and me. If we don't understand how money works and what we need to do to use it wisely, then greedy, manipulative people can step in, lie to us, and create a money system that tyrants use to their own advantage. This is the money system we have in the world today, fractional reserve banking. Yet when people have faith in their money system because it's fair and uses sound principles of units of account, then we no longer need to overcharge or undercharge, and wealth naturally builds up as the joy of improving life, seeking excellence as it's called, takes root. When a business wants to produce the best product and serve the customers in the best way, they're actually striving for perfection, which is a spiritual motivation. Doing a good job is its own reward and it inspires others to do the same. 
This was the way the United States, at least in part, became one of the richest nations on earth. Don't all things in the universe have a spiritual purpose? When that spiritual purpose becomes the center of human life, as it was for the Founding Fathers, greed and corruption are replaced by freedom, abundance, and prosperity. And when a culture of spiritual excellence takes hold of a nation, people regain the clarity to see liars and frauds within their midst. They can thus prevent corrupt actors from taking positions of power and influence. Confidence or trust in a bad money system can cause a lot of problems. Imagine this. Say you're a banker, and you and your family work on your family farm to produce grain, which is then baked into bread. You don't overcharge for your bread, you just ask a fair price. As it turns out, most mom and pop or cottage industry producers just want to make a fair living for their work. But then along comes an evil, Scrooge-like character who decides he's going to take over the baking market in your town. He takes his mercenary force and goes to the neighboring town where he kidnaps 20 women and children and forces them to work as slaves on a farm right next to yours. Now you've got a real problem because this Scrooge can use his slaves to produce grain for his bakery at essentially zero cost because he doesn't pay his workers. He opens up Scrooge baked goods right next to yours and charges 20% less than you do for bread. In just a few hours, you lose 70% of your customers. What do you do? Well, you can't afford to charge 20% less to meet that price without forcing your family to essentially become slaves themselves. After a year, nearly everyone in town has moved to buying Scrooge baked breads and you're out of business. And wondering how all this happened. So what did happen? Well, you and the townspeople allowed the unfair labor practice of slavery to corrupt the money system. This was partially because the townspeople were blind to the unlawfulness of slavery and its toxic effects. Instead of stopping it right away, no one did anything. And what's worse, they bought goods made from slaves that slowly began to distort the town's standardized measure of value, their money ruler. So an evil practice in one area of the economy rippled through the rest of the economy, causing what's called economic contagion to spread. You see, but Scrooge doesn't stop there. Now that he's taken over your baking market in your town, he captures more slaves and takes over blacksmithing too. He takes over the woodcutting industry next and does in other industries. Within 10 years, 90% of the prices have dropped so much that none of the original townspeople can make money causing a depression. Eventually, the Scrooge makes a bargain and says that if the townspeople live on his farm and work for free as slaves, he'll feed them and give them shelter. Oh. Within a few short years, the entire town have turned into slaves of the Scrooge, who now owns almost everything. So what's the primary cause of this situation? The people of this town should have outlawed slavery as an unfair labor practice but they didn't understand their money system and how to keep it fair and lawful so it was easily corrupted. You see, slavery is essentially cheating you because it always costs something to produce something. A worker exchanges their labor for money, which we call a paycheck. Labor costs time and energy. A laborer needs food, shelter, clothing, basic living necessities so they can produce labor, which is why a fair wage is so important. The value of labor is measured in terms of wages, a standardized measure of value. But the Scrooge broke this measuring system by using slave labor, which distorted the measurement system and acted like a cancer that spread throughout the economy of the town. Had the townspeople stopped it, your family farm and bakery would not have gone out of business and the townspeople wouldn't have accepted slavery as the only option. I can think of a few real world situations like this in our, our modern world where cheap labor is used to produce goods at an unfair price. Any country come to mind? China uses slave labor or prison labor to produce a high percentage of their products that we now buy. The U.S. at one time produced most of our own goods and services, but now we get most of it from overseas from producers that use extremely cheap or slave labor to do so. Immigrant labor can also have this effect as well. Folks, this information is so important to understand that I couldn't squeeze it all into one short episode. We still have fundamentally critical information to cover together. In part two, I'll be digging deeper into the central banks, the Federal Reserve, and even the Rothschilds. However, part two will only be over on Rise TV, but the great thing is you can watch it for free. 
In the description below is a link for a free trial of Rise TV. We can only watch part two of this episode, but hundreds of other videos you won't find anywhere else. So click on the link below and I'll see you over at Rise TV. Thank you.